Okay, to get started, we went ahead and booted Kali, and then we're going to go ahead and log into that. Going to resize the screen so it, hopefully we can get it to fit the projector a little bit better. So if you don't have the sleuth kit installed, do an apt get install. Then I believe it's sleuth kit all one word. In this case it says it's already installed to the newest version because it comes pre-installed on this distribution. This is Kali 106. Alright, and then we need to take USB or other disk. It doesn't have to be USB. It can be any any disconnect to a computer. And if it's a new USB, you'll need to wait for the USB to install the device driver for Windows and give that a, all the time it needs plus another 10 seconds or so after Windows says the device driver is installed correctly. The reason is, is that the VirtualBox will not install its drivers until after Windows recognizes the device and, ha and Windows can't do that until it has its device drivers. So it says that Windows is connected so we're going to wait for a second and then go back to Kali and try to capture the USB. For that you go to devices and USB device and you'll see that the USB is listed under this menu now. And then you can try to capture it. Now you know if you captured it, if you do a D message, D-M-E-S-G, and then watch the last few messages to see if it can assign the USB stick a um, a drive basically, assign it to a, as a device. This one's kind of a giveaway because it went ahead and opened up the uh, the window. But if you look in the the messages, you'll see that it installs the USB device, and it should give it a device number if we look in these in these messages. So I believe this one has been labeled as SDB. All right, let's go back to Windows. Uh, we got the USB working. I'm going to detach the USB from Kali. And we'll just say continue without scanning. <coughs> okay, and there's the virtual USB device driver's been installed. We can go ahead and format the drive if we want. This one happens to be pre-formatted from the factory as a FAT32. So if you want to make it a little bit more interesting, you can do an NTFS. Although um, there are still plenty of FAT32 devices still around. I'm going to do a quick format. This will just make sure that there's no um, file allocation tables or any of that on the disk. For the purposes of the demo, it would be a lot easier if we uh, start with a blank slate. And of course, if you're doing this to try to recover deleted files, naturally you would skip the formatting step. <coughs> Alright, I believe that is finished. Let's go put a file on there. We'll say uh, just a text file. We'll name this one invisible.txt. And then we'll name this one deleted.txt. Put some text inside of the first one. And put some text inside the second one.
right? And let's delete deleted dot text. And we should have the USB set up. So we'll go back over to Kali and load the USB back into this operating system. Now if you're booting directly into Kali, maybe you booted off a USB or maybe it's your primary operating system for that matter, uh, naturally you won't have to pass the USB back and forth. All of this is just being done because we're trying to do demos using virtual machines. Okay, so the file system over here in Linux can see the visible file just fine. So we know it has NTFS drivers working. We'll do a D message. And we still have um, SDB assigned to us as the device's name. So if we go over and look in devices, we should be able to see this device. So if we do an LS and dev, and then SDB, then it's there. If you want to see more information, you can do the dash L long format. So you can see it's mounted it as a, um, basically as a, as a floppy drive is what it says, but it's, it does recognize it as a USB. All right, so the sleuth kit is actually a collection of a bunch of different executables and there's about probably a dozen or so in there. A couple of them actually try to do automation, so they'll try to recover files for you. We'll save that one for last. The other tools are used to examine the disk and tell you different things about either the disk or the partition, or the partition tables or the files that are actually in the, um, in the tables themselves. So I got a cheat sheet that I can give away after the demo. So we, we already located the device file name and that was with dmessage. And then the second tool we want to take note of is MMLS. And what this does is it, it gets the, a list of the different partitions that are on the device. So move this to the top of the screen and then we'll do MMLS and we want to name the device that we're talking about. So in this case, it's dev sdb. So there's three basic partitions. There's the, the top of the partition table itself, and then there's some unallocated space, a little bit of a buffer at the front of the disk, and then finally the NTFS partition. And there could be multiple partitions on here. Perhaps you had um, half of it could be FAT32 and half the NTF, NTFS, or it could even be mixed between systems. It's not uncommon to see USB drives that are uh, partially FAT32 and partially EXT4, the Linux operating system. If you set up um, bootable USBs, a lot of times they end up getting formatted that way. But in this case, it's, it's a very simple disk. We just formatted the entire thing with NTFS. These numbers here in the start and the end columns are the offsets of the partitions. So in our case, we notice that the NTFS partition starts at 2168. That's counting from the front of the disk, if you will, relatively speaking. So now we have our partitions, and we'll want to list the file system metadata just to get an example of what kind of information is is available in that file system. You know, if is it if it's NTFS, it's going to be different than if it's FAT32, for example. So we use the FS stat program that comes inside SleuthKit for that. And you notice it takes two arguments. The one of them is the name of the device again, but also this dash O option, and that's the offset for that particular file system. So if we go back and do FS stat, and then the offset is 2168, I believe, and then we'll do dev SDB. So 
So if we scroll this a little bit, we can see that this is an NTFS file system. Of course, we knew that because we formatted the disk ourselves. But obviously, if your friend or cousin or whatever brings you their favorite stash of MP3s and they're like, oops, I deleted the whole thing. Can you get them back for me? You would do this to figure out what kind of file system you're dealing with. And assuming that they have a Windows system, it's going to be one of a couple choices. So. Of course, there's a lot of other information about the file system. Now, the information we're looking at here is not about the files that's on the drive. It's about the file system that's keeping track of the files on the drive. So it talks about where the file system starts and where it's located. And then it gives you some of the records that are in the database that makes up an NTFS file system. So NTFS is essentially a collection of records and then the records themselves can have pointers to other information and at some point they're going to have pointers to the files that are on the file system. So the sleuth kit can read not only the information that's in the database but it can follow the pointers and so forth to go look for the files. Once we have the file system information Let's take a look at listing the files that are on the file system. And there's a tool, FLS, that can do that. And we need to know the offset of the file system again and the disk name. And then also we can pass it some flags that says that we only want to see deleted files or we, we want to see all the files. There's lots of different useful flags with this tool. So we'll do uh, move this to the top of the screen again. We'll do FLS, and let's see. I've already forgotten what the offset was. <laughs> so we'll cheat here. Twenty-one sixty-eight. Okay. So. And let's see. Let's first let's look at some of the options. Actually, these were pretty handy. So the dash A is all files, kind of like in. Um, it's a lot like LS, actually, if you use LS in Linux. It, it's similar to that in some ways. But the dash R can sometimes help because it'll have it go into folders and then look for the files that are in folders and then keep on recursing down the, the tree. We didn't actually create any folders in this case, but that's typically you would have some kind of directory structure that'll help you follow it. And then the dash D is deleted entries only. This works because when you delete a file off of a disk, you don't delete the actual contents of the file itself, the data. You just delete the record of the file in the file system. With some file systems, like NTFS, you're not even actually deleting the record itself. You're just marking it as deleted. This helps the operating system keep track of the space that's available to reclaim later on if it needs that space to store a new file. But there's usually a lot of extra space available and it may take a while for the operating system get, to get around to overwriting the file that was deleted earlier. Also, how many bytes of the file it overwrites is relatively random because it may or may not start a new file at the same offset as the old file. Also, the new file may be shorter than the old file, leaving a little bit of the old file at the end even if you do overwrite it. So we'll do an FLS-O, and I think it was 2168 was the offset. And then do dev scb. Scroll that up a little bit. <clears throat> so down here we have one file that has the, the markings of a deleted file, and that was our deleted.txt. And then we have another file that's visible.txt. So these, um, these numbers right here are the inode numbers, the data structure that keeps track of the location of the file. So a lot of times in the file systems, you won't have the file system directly point at the start of the file. You'll have it point to a data structure like an inode 
that keeps track of information about that file. When was it created? Who was the last person that touched it? What are the permissions on it? And those kind of things. And then the inode itself would have more pointers that would point to the actual data blocks out on the disk where the file is stored. And those don't even have to be contiguous. You can have fragmentation, of course, where you have a maybe two or three blocks in a row that have part of the file, and then you have to jump over to another couple of blocks to get to the next part, and so on. And eventually, you'll reach the end of the file. So this number here is the offset of the inode, which of course itself is relative to the offset of the file system. So we need to plug all that information in to recover it. And there's an icat command. And it has several different op options. One of them is the dash O offset that we need to give it. Notice that you put the image name um, first and then later you say what the inode number was. So the syntax is a little bit different. So we'll do icat with the offset of 2168. And the device was dev sdb. And I think we wanted inode 36. So, and then there's the contents of the file that we deleted. There was no carriage return line feed in the file that we had. And that's why the, the prompt appeared in a funny spot. And then the file before it was 35, which was the visible.txt. And so there's the content of the visible file. So recover and delete files to some extent can be just that easy. The Sleuth Kit is a free tool. It's been around for quite a while. And um, it's actually used professionally, sometimes even by law enforcement and places like that. So we understand the, the basic idea of how to recover delete a file. Then I'll show you one more alter alternative method. And there's a program called TSK Recover that comes with the Sleuth Kit. We do TSK recover. So you give it the, um, optionally you can give it the image type, but a lot of times it'll just figure it out on its own. So even if we don't tell it what kind it is, it, sh it should be able to figure it out. Let's see. Oh, I forgot the output directory, so we'll just put everything in temp. Okay, let me move this top of the screen. Let's look in the temp directory. So there's this file, volume 2168, and 2168 should um, sound familiar to you. That's the offset of the file system. And inside is the deleted.txt file. Notice it ignored the visible file because that one wasn't deleted. So TSK recover recovers deleted files. Oops, cat. And there's the content in the file, but recovered automatically.